Hey everyone, Dan from Mod One here. Let's dig in deep into the resize module. I want to show you some of the more advanced options that you have in here. Now in the introductory video for resize, we showed you how to use the crop tool, how to select a preset, and the basics of sharpening. In this video, I want to show you more about setting custom document sizes, adjusting the settings, the tiling, and the gallery wrap. All right, let's take a look at the quality difference. You notice here in the pixel dimensions pane that this photograph is 4,000 by 3,000 pixels. And if I was to print it at 300 pixels per inch, that's a common resolution you'd use when printing, it's going to make about a 10 inch by 13 inch print, not a particularly common size. Let's go ahead and I'm going to change the size. I'm going to increase it 4x or 400%. If you need to change your document size by a percentage, you can always change the units over here. You can work in pixels or inches or centimeters or millimeters or percent. I'm just going to use 400% in this case. Let's go 400 and hit the tab key. And now when we zoom into 100 here, you'll actually see the quality difference. So as I'm panning around, those are the original pixels in the photo. And when I let go, you'll see what happens when the resize algorithm snaps in. So you can kind of see there's before and I let go after. So you can see how it maintains all the little details in the leaves and the hard edges on the veins, even taking something and blowing it up 400%. We went from a pretty small file now to a photo that's over a gigabyte in size. And if we were to print this out now in size, let's switch from percent back to inches. You're looking at a 40 inch by 50 inch print. So a really big print that we're able to maintain crisp sharpness and detail on. All right, let's go back to fit view for a second. I'm going to hit the reset button. Now, if you just want to scale your photo in a proportional fashion, you can simply type in the desired width or height into the document size fields. Let's say I want to create a print that's 44 inches wide and we'll let the height determine based on whatever the natural proportions of the photo are. So I could type in 44. You notice when I do that, it's going to scale the height to 33. It's going to scale up proportionally. Resize does not support non-proportional scaling. We don't want to create your photo in a stretched fashion. We don't want to stretch it out and make it look weird. If you need to do a non-proportional scaling, you can transform a layer inside of layers first, then scale it. You can change your resolution from the resolution pop-up. And we actually include presets for the most common resolutions you're going to use for different types of output, depending on the size of print and the printer that you're going to use. For example, if you're doing large format printing on an Epson inkjet printer, 240 pixels per inch works out great. Or if you're sending it to your photo lab, you'll probably want something more like 300. Whereas if you're printing a smaller, very sharp photo on an Epson printer, you might print at 360 pixels per inch. We give you those presets to make it easy for you to work. Now let's say I want to take this photo and I want to create a 13 by 19 inch full bleed photo, something that I can print on my Epson printer and I want to be able to fill the entire paper. To do that, we'll use the crop tool. I'm going to select the crop tool and rather than using one of the preset crop sizes, I'll just type in the size that I need. One of the easiest ways to do that is in the crop tool to use one of the built-in paper sizes. So from the crop tool preset, I can just scroll down and I can find that 13 by 19 inch size. That happens to be the Super B 13 by 19 size. So there we go. It set my crop tool to 13 by 19 and it set my resolution to 300. If we need something larger, I can type in what I want. I want 360 for printing on my Epson printer. Now I can move and position my crop box to recompose my photo to fit. There we go. Let's go with something like that. I'll hit the apply button and now it will crop my photo and resize it dynamically to 13 by 19. You notice that's almost a 200% increase in size. That's 171%. Now I'm ready to fine tune it. For the rest of the adjustments for sharpening and settings, we want to make sure we zoom to at least 100%. So you hit the 100% option in the navigator. That'll zoom in and let us take a look at the detail in our photo. The settings options controls which algorithm is used for the resizing and each algorithm sometimes has its own options. Under the image type pop-up, there are presets that make this easy to select. For a photo like this, I would simply select the high detail option. That's going to maintain the most small detail in my photo by adjusting the texture and threshold slider appropriately. If I was to work on a portrait photo, I could select the portrait option instead. Rather than using the genuine fractals algorithm, it'll use a smoother by cubic option, which tends to look better for skin. 
if you're going to manually adjust the texture and threshold slider, keep in mind that the texture slider is going to increase the amount of texture. Texture are the small edges in your photo, things like the tiniest edges in the leaves. The greater you increase the texture slider, the more you're going to see. The threshold slider is going to control the threshold of that texture, basically how much of the texture enhancement you're going to see. So at a texture setting of 4 and a threshold of 100, we're getting lots of that tiny, small texture in my photo. That's what that high detail preset does. The smoothness slider kind of does the opposite. It'll help take the edge off of those fine details. I only tend to adjust the smoothness slider if I have a lot of grass in my photo. Grass, when it gets magnified, will tend to take on kind of a cross-hatched appearance. Adjusting the smoothness slider will reduce that cross-hatched appearance. Next, let's go down to sharpening. Almost every photo is going to need sharpening for printing. Let's turn on the sharpening option. The default is going to be progressive sharpening. This is the one that I'm going to use almost every time. Progressive sharpens the photo differently depending on the size of the edge. The largest edges will get more sharpening compared to the smallest edges. It's easy to adjust. You just use the amount slider and just turn it up or down based on taste. It's a good practice to over sharpen your photo just a little bit when you're going to print. That way, when it goes to the paper and the ink soaks in, you'll maintain that additional sharpness. Now, I've turned it up really high. That's more than I would actually use for a photo like this, but probably something at about the 80 range will probably work out pretty well. There we go. Nice and crisp. There's also options to protect the highlights and shadows. Protecting the shadows can be useful because as you add sharpening, you're going to increase noise. And if you happen to have noisy, dark shadows, you can increase that to help defeat the shadow noise. Beyond sharpening, there's also a film grain option. A film grain does two things. On a monochromatic photo, it helps the photo appear sharper. The other thing it can help you do is on a photo that has lots of continuous tone, not a photo like this. When I say continuous tone, I typically mean areas of sky or especially areas that are out of focus. It'll help to reduce what we call quantizing error, or posterization. When you print out a photo that has a long continuous gradient on it, it's very difficult for a printer to create that. So adding a little film grain can help to compensate for that. It'll help add just enough tooth to it that it'll print better. And I covered that in the basic photo. It's pretty easy. All you do is just turn it on and that will add a film grain pattern to it. Typically the default of 50 works out great. I'm going to turn it off for this photo. I don't really need it. Now below, let's talk about a couple other special case options. There's the tiling tool. Tiling allows you to take your photo and break it down into smaller pieces. This is useful if you're making a really, really big photo and you want to be able to print it on your home printer into smaller pieces. So this photo we were going to set at a 13 by 19. Let's go really big with it. Rather than 13 by 19, let's say I want to make it 10 feet tall. So I'm going to change my height in here to 120 inches. So there we go. We've blown this thing up really big. So it's 10 feet tall and like 12 feet wide now. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have a printer that can print 10 feet tall. So I need to break this down into pieces. So using the tiling tool will help me do that. So let's turn the tiling pane on and I can set the size that I want. Now, if I had a large format printer that could print in 24 inch wide strips, I could easily change my width in here to 24 and then I'm going to set my height to 175. So let's just change this width to 24 inches and a height of 175. What was it? 175.37. There we go. Now we've divided it up into eight strips that I can now print on a large format printer that prints 24 inches wide. Let's say I had to print eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper to create this wall. I could change the width to 8.5 and my height to 11. And I could even put in a percentage of overlap so that each tile overlaps a little bit so I could tape them together. Let's say I want a quarter of an inch overlap. So there we go. It'll now break down my giant mosaic into 264 letter sized pieces of paper with a quarter of an inch overlap between them. So I could create a big giant mosaic on my small desktop printer. The output section, you select the file type for each of those tiles and where you want them saved. And it'll put them all into a folder and it will name them based on row column order. So you'll get row one, column one, row two, column one, for example. And it'll output that entire mosaic for you. Now, another special case scenario is for a gallery wrap. If you're printing on canvas, you need to add wings to the edge of your canvas that will wrap around the wooden stretcher bar so you don't actually lose any of your photo. Now, I'm going to go back to a more modest size. I'm not going to make a 10 foot tall gallery wrap. 
So let's go back here and let's change my height in this case to 20 inches instead. So I'm going to make about a 20 by 30 inch print. There we go. Now in the gallery wrap section, you can select the thickness of those gallery wrap wings. Two inches is the most common setting. Typically most photo labs print on inch and a half bars for their thickness and you want a little bit to be able to wrap all the way around. So two inches is a good size. You can then pick the type that you want for the gallery wrap. Reflect is the most common. You notice what it does is at the edge, it just takes the two inch thickness and mirrors it and flips it out. But there's also an option to do the reflect soft option, which will do that same reflection, but it will then soften the area that's outside of it. It'll blur it a little bit, or you could use a stretch option. Stretch will take a smaller area of the border and will stretch it across the edge of the border. And the stretch soft will then blur that a little bit. Stretch soft is the option that I'll typically use, especially if I have anything really recognizable near the edge. You can also add a color to this outside area as well. So if you don't want part of the image, you just want a solid color. Let's say you want to print a black border around the outer edge. You can select the color by clicking on the color. Well, I'm going to use black in this case, but you could use the dropper to pick a different color. Maybe I wanted to add a red border all the way around it. And then using the opacity slider, you can control how opaque that color overlay is. So if I turn it all the way up to 100, I'll get a bright red border that goes all the way around my photo. Just like that. Well, of course, when I hit the done button, it's going to crop and resize my photo. It's going to add the sharpening and any of the other options that I've asked it to create for me. Now, sometimes you might need to do some batch processing where you want to resize multiple files to a smaller size. You can use the Genuine Fractals engine to do that through the export module. You can do this from browse or from resize or really from any of the modules. I'm just going to select a big group of photos. I'll click on the export button to go to resize. Here in the photo size pane, you can select any size you want. If you don't see the photo size pane, go up to the plus button and make sure photo size is turned on. You can then type in whatever size you need to create. You can scale it based on the overall width and height, the long edge or the short edge. You can also select the resolution when you do this as well. Let's say I need to create eight by tens from all of these photos. I can come in here. We can go to the width and height and I'll set this to inches and I will change the width to 10 and the height to eight and my resolution to 300. It will now go through and it'll take each photo, make it an eight by 10 or a 10 by eight if it's a vertical photo, crops out the eight by 10 middle of the photo and resizes the resolution to 300. Then below, I can control the amount of sharpening, the file type that I want and how I want to name them. It's an easy way to prepare lots of photos to go to the lab. Or if you're a stock photographer and you need to submit your photos, you can control the size of the photos you're creating for your stock submission. All right, there you go. There's kind of an advanced tour of the more powerful options in resize. Thanks for watching.